Hello there, my name's Tony Harmer. I am Chief Enchantments Officer at Wizardry Limited. I'm also a LinkedIn Learning and Lynda.com author, affectionately known as the Design Ninja. You can check out my courses on LinkedIn Learning and Lynda.com, and I also have tutorials on youtube.com slash the Design Ninja. What we're going to look at today are some compelling reasons why you should be using Photoshop as a photographer. There used to be an amusing anecdote from one of my friends at Adobe who used to say, if you are a photographer, designer, graphic artist, concept artist, engineer, architect, astrophysicist, then Photoshop is the tool for you because it can do so many things. But people often forget its primary purpose originally was to make more of your images. So let's look at the features that really relate to you as a photographer, rather than those that are for other particular professions. So I'm here in Bridge, and what I'm going to do first of all is open up a RAW file, because I'm willing to bet that as photographers, the chances are you shoot to RAW. So what I'm going to do is right click here and open this particular RAW file in Camera Raw. So taking a look at this just on the surface, the first thing we can look at here, if I zero out all of the settings, so if we just go back to the default settings here, just to make sure everything there is zero, the only thing that's changed, of course, is the temperature, because that's from the white balance there, that I've got some profiles. Now, the difference between profiles and presets is presets apply a range of settings. Profiles don't. They're just interpretations that the Camera Raw interpreter can do for you. So if I go to Adobe Landscape, for example, you might have just seen that some of the sky and some of the landscape suddenly popped just a little bit more. And there are a number of profiles that we could be using here. At the moment, it's defaulting to Adobe Landscape, which is logical, and that's what it would do. And there's some artificial intelligence here working under the hood to help us out. Now, we do also have ranges of different things for different interpretations, such as artistic. And all of these will modify the appearance of the raw file as it's being interpreted. Of course, there's bunches of these different things that you can use and explore. You'll notice I don't have to apply them just by scrolling over them it shows me what they would look like and then I can click on one if I choose to select it. However, I'll stick with Adobe Landscape just here and I'm going to use the back arrow so I can go to my settings. So there's quite a lot we can actually do from the outset. In fact, it's probably limitless to be perfectly honest. So if I wanted to model the exposure, now first of all, just have a quick look at the cursor there OK, you can see that it's turned to what I like to call stapler accident finger. This hand with these arrows pointing out of it. That means you can actually start working at that point. So if I, for example, press down on my trackpad and move to the left and to the right, you can see that the slider there is following along with me. And that's really handy because these targets can be quite small. And by targets, of course, I mean the actual slider. In fact, anecdotally, here's a thing for you. It's a saying from the military, and it, this would be around about the Victorian times, I guess. The time taken to acquire a target is a function of the distance to and size of the target, which means the bigger it is, the easier it is to hit it, and of course, the closer you are as well. Well, here, that's doing exactly that. I can go over any of these values I don't need to click on the actual slider and I can just change them like so. Now, of course, here I'm working in the range of the highlights and I can see the histogram above is giving me live feedback on that. And I'd be really interested to see if I'm actually clipping anything and I can visualize that. If I tap U on my keyboard, that will show me underexposed areas. And if I tap O on my keyboard, it will show me the areas that are clipping or burning out um, the highlights just there. So if I push the highlights upwards, 
a bit more, you can see that, of course, I'd be blowing out those highlights. So I can bring those down like so. Similarly, if I went to the shadows and pushed those down too far, you'd start to see blue overlays. Mind you, I'd have to go quite away. I might have to go right into the blacks. There we go. Okay, so you can see there that I'm pushing it just too far. So it's really handy to have that overlay. I can also double click on any of the sliders and they'll return back to their neutral position, as you can see just there. So all really super handy. Let's just take a look at a few of the other features that we've got here that you may not be aware of. So we've got some options here such as texture, which add some subtle texture to your image and can actually bring out a little bit more pop in the image. Clarity, which is like a localized form of sharpening or unsharpening, if you like. If I take this right the way down, you can see I've got a very soft edge. In fact, that looks very, very painterly on this particular image. But of course, I'm pushing it way too far, really. So I might want to add a bit of negative clarity there. Dehaze is an algorithm that will actually take the moisture out of the air. You'll see that if I push this, and again, I'm going to go too far to start off with. Look what's happening to the clouds and, in fact, the whole image there. And conversely, I could do that okay, as negative dehaze and give it a bit of a mist like so. I'll just double click that and also I'm just going to turn off my shadow and highlight clipping warnings just here for the moment. So just tapping U and O to do that. So nice and easy to do. The temperature is just fine just here. I might just add just a tiny bit of tint in there. OK, and we'll move down a bit. I can add vibrance if I want to in a certain range. So if I take that, up, for example, towards the yellows there, you'll see that rapeseed uh, suddenly really, really pops. On there, I can change the saturation. I've also got curves here that I can work with and per channel as well. And of course, that is what you'd actually expect. I'll just go ahead now and go into details so I can do all of my sharpening here. Now, here's a quick tip for you. When you're doing this, you need to be in at 100% or more, or you won't truly be able to see the results of the sharpening. And you can hold down the Alt or Option key on your computer and it will give you a grayscale preview. So you can actually make more informed judgments there, okay, without the distraction of color. And you've got options for noise reduction and color noise reduction there as well. I'll just come out of that or take us back to viewing the whole image. I'm just going to go into the color mixer here and you can see we can actually work with the hue saturation and luminance. Here's another quick tip. I'm just going to drop the blue luminance down a bit and you can see that the sky there is really, really coming out very, very blue. We've got options for split toning. If we wanted to change the toning of this, make a more creative interpretation, we can do that. Also got options for optics. So if I choose to remove chromatic aberration here and to use profile corrections, then it will look for my lens profile and adjust accordingly. And it's updating that as manufacturers work with new lenses and different cameras. I've got a geometry setting here, so I can go ahead and auto straighten. So I've got a few different options here. I'm going to just apply a level correction. And you can see that spins around just a little bit. It's being auto cropped there and some effects. So if I want to go around and do some vignette in here, for example, just a shade, uh, then I could do that there as well. And also I've got options for calibration as well. I've got a bunch of tools here in the camera raw interpreter. So let's go to crop to start off with. Now this image has already been cropped. OK, but what I'm going to do is crop it just a little bit more and also show you that there are various different overlays that you can use here one of which is center because sometimes you're actually aiming for a particular target okay in the image and this makes it easier for you to line that up like so so there you are if i was after that particular area there then i'd be pretty much game on i'm just going for this sort of bush that's poking out just a bit there as well. 
Okay, I'll just right click that and return that back to rule of thirds and have a look at that. Of course, typically I wouldn't do things right smack bang in the middle, but here I'm just going to go with it. I think, although my <laughs> kind of urging away from that just a bit. There we are. So now I've got that. So I've got my crop there, of course, completely non destructive. I've also got some healing options here. Now, I might not want these edges here, these bits of bush. Uh, coming out into the image so what I can do is clone them away like so non-destructively and I can determine where the actual source is coming from so I can bring that up for example and replace it with content from the actual image okay. and I have options as well for how that actually works whether it works as a clone okay or whether it works as a heal and I can change various different aspects of that i think i'm just going to go up to about this region just for the purposes of this demonstration i'll pretty much go above it like so and i could continue to do that throughout okay let's go back to the whole image again and look at a couple of other things that we've got here we've also got some local adjustments we have a brush that we can perform with local adjustments with we have a graduated filter let's use one of those just down here so if i bring this out it's just showing me the overlay at the moment so i can see where it's being applied now green everything before the green is being fully applied everything after the red it has no effect at all and as you've probably worked out this is the transition area just here between the two i'll just turn the overlay off so we don't need to actually see that actually i'll go for the mask overlay just there and now we'll make some changes i'll drop the exposure right down in that area so we really are being pulled in to the image just there i want to make the greens just a shade more green in there like so using the uh, color balance to do that there of course i could also change the hues using this slider and there's a fine adjustment control for when you're almost there but it's tricky to drag and you could do that as well i'll just take this to something crazy you can actually do that as well by holding down the option key or alt key and then it will move much much slower again double click on that and it returns back to neutral and maybe i want to desaturate that area just a little bit as well even things like dehaze are in that particular region and i can add as many of those as i want so let's just bring one in just up here for example and maybe i want to just darken this down a bit at the top here like so but i don't want it to affect the tree how am i going to do that well the answer is i can apply a range mask and i can have that based on color or on luminance i think i'll go luminance just here i'm going to visualize the luminance map you can see everything drops to grayscale and now I can see this red overlay here. And because the area I want to exclude there is dark, I'm just going to bring that range up. And you can see the tree starting to darken in there. I've also got a control for smoothness. So that kind of backs it on and off just a little bit there. And if I turn that off, you can see that suddenly I've got some of that information back. Of course, you could see we could just go on and spend a whole day doing these things because we have radial adjustments here as well and so much more. And of course, when I'm done, I can just open this as a smart object in Photoshop just in case I wanted to do anything else as well. It will take it a moment to do that, but then it hands over and you'll be able to see the thing inside of Photoshop. It's just doing that now. And there it is, like so. Okay, let's pop back to the bridge because something else you might do is you might shoot a range of bracketed exposures. And what I'm going to do is open these in Camera Raw and then I'll select that range like so. Right click on it and choose Merge to HDR. And it will take all of those exposures and bring them all together and compile them into an HDR image. And there it is, and it's also looked at areas that are quite different, and it's ghosted those things out. So imagine that you're shooting something with telegraph wires, for example. They would move as the air moved around them, and it will look for the best 
overall of those and then just add that and you can see here that i can see this expressed in a number of ways so i can get it to work harder if i want it to which it's doing right now or i can get it to work uh, not so hard or go somewhere in the middle or not work at all if i wanted to work on that afterwards so great that it's bringing all of those exposures together it will then create me one hdr which i can save out from here like so and then i can go ahead and tone the hdr now just to show you if i go into the basic tab here where normally i can move this exposure slider uh, around about four to five stops here i can take this all the way to 10 in both directions because of all of the extra information that i have there so merging those together which it can also do for panoramas and hdr panoramas where it will go ahead and do all of that processing and then merge everything together okay i'm just going to tap cancel on that particular one i don't need to save uh, those changes so something you're probably going to want to do in photoshop is to make selections let's look at a couple of things just here i'm going to open this file of a zebra just here like so now you'll be aware i'm sure of the various different selection tools that it has here so here are some shape based selection tools there are uh, rectangular elliptical and single column and row pixel selections there we've got the freehand tools but we've also got some amazing tools here such as quick selection which you can use as a brush i'm just going to increase the size of my brush here and as i brush it learns and starts to pick up that information i'm just going to tap q here so you can see what it's picking up at the moment i'll deselect that what i'm going to do instead is i'm going to use another tool here this is the object selection tool and if i drag around the zebra like so it analyzes that area here's the selection i have this time very very different uh, to what i had earlier on with the quick selection tool right but i don't even need to use that in some cases i can actually if there is a clear subject in the image choose to select that subject and then the ai inside of photoshop looks around and picks up the subject if i just go ahead here you can see i've got slightly more in some places maybe that i don't need but i can also get rid of those so i can use them in tandem so for example i could hold down the alt or option key with the object selection tool and get it to look at that shadow okay and it removes some of that and i could do that in other areas too let me just switch this to a lasso okay i'm holding down alt or option here because that way it will analyze differently and now if i tap q you can see that already i'm getting a much cleaner selection but beyond that there's actually a special workspace that you can use called select and mask now here at the moment my transparency i'm using the onion skin uh, preview here there are a range of different previews that you can use for example on white here with an overlay and so on so you can see what you're doing against the image now i've got selection tools such as the quick selection tool in here so i could carry on selecting i've got something to refine edges so for example if i wanted to go along this main i could get it to analyze that and get me a better result just there let's just tune up the transparency and you can see already that i'm getting a great selection from that now if i had more time of course than we do in this quick whirlwind session we could perhaps go on and create a perfect selection from there but for the moment that's just fine we can then output that in a number of different ways masks are a big thing in photoshop so i could get this to appear on a new layer with a layer mask if i want to that means nothing is actually destroyed completely non-destructive then there you go and i can carry on working from there because this is on a mask all i need to use are some of photoshop's amazing brushing tools here to go ahead 
and paint in and out of the mask. Okay, let's have a look at the object selection tool in yet another image here. Let's get one of one of my dogs. This is Buddy just here. He's an excellent toy killer. Uh, that's what he's doing right now, busy killing toys. And I'll go ahead and use the object selection tool here in lasso mode. And I'll go around this poor, poor bee creature here that's been thoroughly shredded already. And even with that, you can see that it works out what I'm actually after just there, which means I can do various things such as a bit of cloning here. Clone stamp tool, I'm going to use a slightly bigger brush. I'm going to go along the same focal plane here and to option click to tell it where I want the information to come from. Okay, and then I can just go ahead and brush in that area. Actually, let me just change the opacity there. Mine's a bit too low. Okay, and I could do that. Or if I wanted to, I could go ahead and use a healing tool. There are a number of different healing tools. So for example, I could use the patch tool just here, drag that along like so and say, right, that's fine. That's what I'd like to use. And you can see it heals it. And then I have some options here for how it will actually work. So I can change various things such as the diffusion there and so on to get a better result from the word go or of course switch back and do a bit of cloning in the areas where it's not exactly what I want and that's a great way to work. In fact the content aware algorithms that Photoshop has are legendary. If I just go ahead here and get my lasso tool and I'm going in fact to use the polygonal lasso tool here I'm going to make a polygonal selection around this corner like so. I'll just double click there. So now I've got this corner selected. I'll just show you how that looks. I'm simply going to hit delete. And it says, how do I want to deal with this deletion? I'm going to say use content aware. And it analyzes the image, looks around the selection, and it replaces what's there. And that, I think you'll agree, is a pretty good job. Sometimes you do need to do a little bit of secondary healing, uh, but that isn't too bad with where it is just right now. And there are also healing tools that you can work with a single click, such as the spot healing brush tool. Let's make this one a bit larger, like so. And then just go ahead and make some heals. Here I can actually paint with this one, like so, and these threads just around here. Let's change my brush there. And just with single clicks, you can see how it's working around that. Let's try one out here. Go really, really big and quite soft. You can see that I can change my brush on screen here. I'm going to go around this duck. Well and truly destroyed that duck. <laughs> there we go. In just a few clicks and it's gone. And I could, of course, carry on. There are so many different things that can be done using the content aware algorithm. Let's open something else up. We'll do a little bit more cloning. Let's go ahead and open up this DNG file just here. Okay, so early morning stuff. This is a digital negative. And I'm just going to tune a couple of things here just to start off with. Okay, I think what I'll do is just go ahead and use the color mixer here and just pop some luminance into some various different places. I'm going to bring the blues out a bit and make the reds a bit stronger. The oranges, like so, you can see how that's working just there. And of course, maybe a couple of other things. Just pop a little bit of dehaze on there and just soften it out with a bit of negative clarity. Tiny bit of texture. It's going to work pretty well. And um, actually, if I wanted to, I could show you the split toning thing just here. So let's just say I wanted to go really, let's go crazy with this one. Let's pick a couple of hues just here and then. Increase their saturation. You can see how easy it is for me to go ahead and create a cross process look like so. Nice and simple. I'm just going to double click each of those sliders there just to set them back to neutral. I could, of course, have chosen to undo those as well. I'm going to open this up as a smart object in Photoshop. Smart objects are really cool because you can't destroy them, they are wrapped inside this protective layer and you can do various things 
to them, such as tone them and tune them, okay, but you can't destroy them without going in to the smart object as I am just now. Okay, that's the only thing you can do. And in fact, as that's a DNG file just there, I can't destroy it anyway because it is a negative. The only way I'm going to destroy it is by deleting it from my file system. So let's just add a brand new layer in here in Photoshop. Okay, and what I'm going to do is select my stamp tool. I'm going to make sure that this is set to current and below. Okay, I'm then going to go ahead and clone a few things out here. Let's change my brush size. So I'm just going to select just here. Option click that. Move across. And you can see how easily I can just remove distracting objects. Okay, from the actual image there and those heels are actually on a separate layer so I can carry on safe in the knowledge that I'm not destroying anything just two last things before we finish let me just show you here that what we can also do even though we are not in camera raw at the moment there is actually a camera raw filter that you can use here let me get rid of my cloned uh, layer just to avoid any confusion there so if I go to my filter menu, you can see Camera Raw Filter, which gives me all of the power of Camera Raw, but on a layer or even part of a layer with a selection. So there you go. There's a whole load of different reasons there that you might want to go ahead and start exploring Photoshop. Hope you do. You'll find it's a really big program with lots and lots to explore, and you can create amazing images. Okay, that's all from me for now. I hope you've enjoyed it. See you later. Bye.